the director of FIATEC, and I'm going to be hosting the call today. We have a couple minutes before the top of the hours, but wanted to get the broadcast started, let you know we're connected and live and ready to go. Uh, hope everyone's having a really good start to their week, and we're looking forward to the information on our webinar that will be shared today. So give us just a minute or so to see if anyone else additionally joins us before the before the hour. And hope all of you are doing well. So <clears throat> just through the webinar, you're welcome to submit questions and we will as those questions come in, uh, look at those. If there are things that fit well to discuss along the way, we'll answer questions along the way. Or if they seem things that maybe cover at the end, we'll save some for, for after the presentation to cover within the hour of our webinar. Okay, well, I have coming up right at the top of the hour, so we, we will get underway. <clears throat> today's webinar is on the ROI of BIM, uh, Vela Systems Field Management Software and iPads. And it will cover building innovation, leveraging emerging technologies in construction. And we have two presenters today. Uh, Will Center is in the Durham office of Skanska USA building. It's a leading global provider of construction management services. Currently, Will is working on the James B. Hunt Jr. Library Project at North Carolina State University, where he is responsible for their lead and in BIM innovation implementation. Previously, Bill was a part of the pre-construction group at Skanska, where he worked on projects across the East Coast primarily in the healthcare, higher education, and commercial market segments, including numerous lead projects. He has also worked on special projects at Skanska, including work with the lead consulting group and the national innovation initiatives presented to numerous. Will was recognized in 2011 as the region's Green Advocate of the Year by the Triangle Business Journal and currently serves as chair of the board of directors in the U.S. Green Building Council, North Carolina Triangle Chapter. He has also presented to numerous local organizations, including CMAA, CSI, AGC, and AIA, and at national industry events, including AGC's BIM Forum, Autodesk University, ENR's Future Tech, and Construct Tech's Technology Day. Center graduated with honors from Duke University in 2006, with a BSE in Structural Engineering and a Master's of Engineering Management. So we're happy to have Will with us today. And our second presenter is Josh Carner. Josh Canner. Josh is VP of Marketing and Business Development at Vela Systems, Field Management Software, provider for contractors, owners, architects, and engineers. Josh is responsible for all of the external communications from Vela Systems, including close to 20 customer webinars, YouTube videos, and case studies. So we're pleased to have Josh and Will with us today. And Will, please go ahead. Great. Thanks, Ray. Um, and thank you to Fiatech for having us uh, for the webinar today. Am I able to advance the slide? There we go. Um, so this, this presentation uh, will go over a case study uh, that we've done at Skanska on the James B. Hunt Jr. Library Project. It is the signature building for NC State's Centennial Campus um, and really a uh, landmark building for the university. Um, I, I'm going to go through some, some really quick details on the project just to give you a little bit of context for the rest of the discussion today. Uh, but what's made our project really unique is an innovation grant that Skanska applied for. We have internal funding available for innovation. Uh, and our project team applied for a grant to study the ROI of innovative systems in construction. And being on NC State's campus, 
uh, with a great engineering and construction management school, we set it up as a partnership. So we were able to bring on a graduate level researcher who worked with us for about a year and a half. Uh, he spent about half his time here on site with the project team and half his time over at the university doing his research, really to dig into the ROI of these new systems and these new ways of building buildings. Um, and so we're really excited to share some of the findings of that research because we felt like it, it gives a much more uh, rigorous, detailed investigation than what you would typically see uh, from a lot of other folks who do their own sort of internal studies. So to give you a little bit of context, the Hunt Library is about a $90 million uh, construction project. We've been lucky enough to work with a world-renowned design firm in Snohetta. Uh, for any of you who have been to NC State or around North Carolina, uh, NC State is a campus known for red brick on just about every single building. And as you can tell from uh, the image on the screen there, there is no red brick on this building. So it really is a standout project. Um, it's full of innovative systems, micro tiles, touch screen displays, uh, an automatic book storage and retrieval system. There are actually very, very few stacks inside this library. All the books are stored in high density storage shelving with robotic arms that pull the books out um, as they're requested. So really a state of the art innovative library. And we wanted to take that challenge of innovation over from not just the systems that go into the library, but the way that we build it as well. So for the presentation today, I'm going to run through just really quickly an overview of the different technology systems and innovations that we employed really through the life cycle of the project from pre-construction uh, all the way through to handover. And then we'll sort of change gears and look at the ROI and talk about how we approached quantifying costs and benefits um, and sort of attributing that to different parties and coming up with a, a final ROI. And after that, Josh will give you a, a little quick rundown on the all systems, um, and we'll deal with any lingering questions at that point. So through the life cycle of the project, uh, th this job started in pre-construction back you know, four years ago. So this was, um, I think, a, a few generations back on software like Autodesk's uh, quantity takeoff program. This is a, a first iteration of what they floated out there. And so we started getting quantities of materials out of the model. Um, found great success for structural systems, uh, you know, partitions, finishes, things like that. Being able to strip these quantities out of the model really expedite our estimating process, our quantification process, and spend time during pre-construction really enhancing the rest of our pre-con effort, whether that was uh, getting market input on cost, doing constructability, early coordination and clash detection during the design phase, working with the design team, really able to spend more time on that since we didn't have to spend as much time quantifying parts and pieces in the building. Another big benefit was in the visualization piece. I, I know, you know when folks talk about, hey, what are the benefits of, of BIM, um, vis visualization is such a low-hanging fruit piece. But we have really found that it can't be understated, especially when you're dealing with subcontractors and folks out in the marketplace who, uh, on a unique, challenging building like this, really can benefit from being able to visualize complex intersections, corners. You can see uh, on the left there an image from our curtain wall shop drawing reviews. You know, I'm not going to sit here and tell you we were 100% paperless because obviously we weren't. But we were able to significantly expedite a lot of these reviews by using the model in coordination with the 2D drawings. You can see our, our smart board, our superintendent marking up details there on the screen. We were able to do our uh, constructability red lines electronically, send them back to the design team much easier for them to integrate comments. Um, this really became a key tool for us in communicating our schedule, our sequencing, um, and really just the entire construction process to our subcontractors and to our owners as well on how we were going to work the project forward. Of course, we did our logistics planning and scheduling um, using the model as well, You know, all pretty standard stuff. Uh, in our case, we really focused on the structural sequence and the skin sequence to coordinate those and identify issues with you know, topping slab placements, which would have uh, impacted where we were hanging our curtain wall panels. So you know, this is relatively standard stuff, I think, across the industry as far as 4D scheduling goes. Um, I want to spend a little more time talking about the Vela systems piece. Uh, for those of you who don't know Vela, we really approach this as a central hub for our quality information. So um, one of the really nice things about Vela is that it's open to everyone on the project, our design team, our owners, our subcontractors. Uh, and you can see
see the different modules there on the left side of the screen, whether it's issues, which really just tracks a database of items. It could be work to complete items. It could be punch list things. Um, we've got quality control checklists in there, safety checklists, and then equipment that we can track. And what was really great about this is that, you know, because our design team has access, they can go and enter their issues directly. Because our subcontractors have access, they're automatically notified. We're not stuck in the middle. We're not reformatting Excel spreadsheets. Um, it, it really streamlined our task, made our communication a lot easier, and made our lives much more effective. Um, you can see we redlined all our drawings electronically, hyperlinked RFIs. Those were all available through Vela. You can also see you can attach pictures. Um, really a, a great feature to help more easily communicate any issues you have. When you can snap a picture in the field, uh, cloud it, sketch on it, really becomes much easier to convey any concerns or issues you've got to the subcontractor so you're not going back and forth and repeating yourself uh, over and over on what your issues are on the project. To really make this effective, though, you have to take it out into the field. So, of course, there's a, a strong field mobility component. Uh, again, with us starting this project three or four years ago, um, we were back in the pre-iPad days. So you can see on the right there, one of our owners using a, a tablet computer. That's a, a Motion F5V uh, tablet with a built-in barcode scanner. Um, once iPads became available and Vela started supporting uh, their Vela field solution, on the iPad, we switched over to using those. So our superintendents use them quite a bit in the field to do their quality checklists, create issues. Our architecture team borrows the iPad to go out and do their punch list. Um, so it, it really is a great solution to getting that information out to the point of construction so they can view those marked up drawings, they can enter their issues, um, and do it all without having to move back and forth between the job site and the drawings back up in the trailer. So, Skanska has been using field mobility solutions, whether it's iPads or tablets, for a number of years. Um, and we realized you know, that they work great, but there are some drawbacks. You know, for starters, not all of our superintendents love having a tablet or an iPad on their hip all day. Um, you know, some of them hate the small screen. Some of them you know, just don't like uh, having to sync something up you know, once a day. So there's a drawback there. And the ones who do carry it, uh, we found that they sort of become the answer man to all the subcontractors. So you know, when, when a subcontractor sees a Skanska person with a tablet or an iPad, they realize, oh, I can go get the most recent RFI or the most recent shop drawing from that person because he's got his, his little uh, you know, electronic answer machine that he's carrying around. And so we wanted to find a solution that could get this information, this rich electronic data that we now have access to, into the hands of everyone on the project. So we came up with what we call a mobile electronic resource station. It's got access to the marked up plans and specs, all those RFIs that are linked. It's also got access to the building information models, whether that's the design models, the uh, MEP coordination models. Um, all, all that information is, is available electronically on the plan station, quality control checklists, safety information. Um, we actually had a, a, a unique acoustical plaster system that uh, the subcontractor didn't really have a lot of experience installing. When their field crew got here, we watched a video on YouTube um, with instructions on how to install the plaster system. So this really became a great resource for us to get information out into the field. So again, we're not stuck relying on the tablet or the iPad as the only point of entry for that information. And it meant that our subcontractors and our superintendents could spend more time doing their job uh, because they weren't just answering questions all the time. You can see. One of the uh, electricians up in the upper right there um, who loves using the plan station to review the MEP coordination models. So he'll go and pull up the model for the area he's doing his installation that week, and he'll actually navigate through and find where he's installing his conduit, check the coordination, make sure it's jiving with you know, the ductwork and things that's already installed there, so he can let us know of any issues or variances before they become a problem. It was really interesting for us because you know, this is the, the first box quite of this size and scale that we built as our, our team. So it took us a little bit of time to get it up. By the time we had it installed and running, we hadn't really thought about training. And so we put the box out there, got it functional. About a week later, we realized, gee, you know, do we need to be sort of offering training to the subcontractors on how to open the model, how to navigate it, how to view the plans? And so we came up with a little basic training. We went out to do it. And lo and behold, the subcontractors were already using it. They figured out how to open the model. They figured out how to navigate, um, how to access the plans and the RFIs. 
this was so accessible and so easy for them. Um, you know, they all have computers. The navigation in Navisworks has really now become uh, not unlike a lot of video games that they can figure out how to walk and look around. Um, it, it really is an easy, easy solution. It was very approachable to everyone on the project, which made it incredibly successful as far as really opening up access to the information that we've got at our fingertips. So we also really tried to use technology to solve some of our building-specific challenges. What were the risks associated with this project? One big one for us was on the exterior envelope. Um, this was a very complex, customized, unitized curtain wall system. Uh, in the upper right, you can see at the fabrication facility where they're installing the brackets for the solar blades, the vertical shading devices. You can see on the picture on the left, we've actually got about five miles of solar blades on this building. Um, there are five different paint colors for the aluminum, six different types of trade glass. You can see sort of the, the weaving pattern. Um, really, very, very few of the 800 plus panels we have on this project are alike. Uh, so it really became like a jigsaw puzzle. And of course, as with you know every enclosure, it's on our critical path. And so we really needed a way to aggressively manage the installation of this unitized curtain wall system to make sure that it wasn't impacting the overall schedule of the project. And so what we did is we looked back at a system that was implemented on the MetLife uh, Stadium, the new Meadowland Stadium that Skanska built in New Jersey uh, for the Jets and Giants, where we put RFID tags on precast panels and tracked their status through the supply chain. So we, we looked at our supply chain for the curtain wall and implemented a similar system, except instead of RFID tags, we used barcode tags. And you can see them installed uh, here in the corner of each curtain wall panel as it arrives on the site. One of the subcontractor's employees scans that barcode. You can see he's doing it on that motion tablet there. And he updates the status as being arrived on site. Um, and we tracked it through the supply chain from fabrication to its shipment to its receiving to its installation. He also is able to do all his quality control checklists there, which is important because it keeps all the quality control data uh, in one place. So if there are any QC issues when that unit leaves the uh, fabrication facility, say it had to ship with a missing part uh, that was going to be installed later in the field. We've got that information in the same QAQC system we're using here on site. So when we do our installation checklist and everything later on, we still have a record of that missing piece and any of the QAQC history from the fabrication facility as well. And that was something that was all done through Vela. So each of these pieces of curtain wall was loaded in as a piece of equipment in Vela's equipment library, tracked through its supply chain status, and that information was then pushed across into our building information model. So you can see on the screen here uh, a screenshot of our model from the middle of the installation. You can see panels in green were installed. Panels that are blue were received on site. Panels that were orange were ready to ship. And panels that were pink were still in production. So this gave us a really quick, easy visual snapshot of our installation status. So we can see exactly where we were at any time without having to sort of wade through a big database of, OK, this unit is in production, and where is it on the building? Um, this gave us a, a very quick, easy visual snapshot, which was important because there were times when you know, we had hiccups uh, in the installation. We had to look at resequencing. Um, this let us know very quickly, OK, these panels could be ready next week. If we needed to jump our installation sequence, change the plan of attack, and move over to this area, you know, we could have panels in the next couple days. In this case, we'd have to wait a week to get our panels. So this really helped us manage that supply chain much more effectively. It also allowed us to export some data uh, and, and look at production rates. So we were able to pull data out of Vela into Excel and make a really quick, essentially histogram style graph here of our fabrication and installation production rates to be able to see how many units were we making per week, how many units were we installing per week, which if there are any other uh, general contractors or construction managers on the phone who are used to a subcontractor promising them the world every week and saying, you know, I'm going to make 80 panels and we're going to install 80 panels next week and it's going to be great and we're going to hit the schedule, um, and then they fall short of that, this was a great tool for us because we could go back and look, last week we installed this many panels. Or in our case, with so many different types of panels, the last time that we installed a panel like this, you know, you were only able to make 30 that week. 
And so we know that, you know what, the projection for next week really should only be 30, not 80. And you've only got 20 units in production right now, so I know you're not going to get me 80 next week. So this is really about taking advantage of the rich data that we have as a result of the supply chain management process and using it to make more educated, intelligent decisions about adjacent work, about our planning, and the way we're going to execute the project. And so th this is really a, a huge benefit for us. At the time we went out to bid, uh, our bidders were telling us they wanted 24 months from release of contract to completed installation, essentially being dried in. Uh, we were shooting for 12 months. We were able to do it in 13. So we weren't quite able to hit the 50% uh, um, reduction from 12 to or 24 to 12 months, but we were very happy that we were able to get it done in 13 months. Um, and a lot of that was, you know, using the model for coordination for shop drawing reviews, and then having this supply chain management protocol in place to really aggressively track and push the fabrication and installation process to make sure we stayed on track. We also did a similar uh, barcoding and supply chain management process on our door frames. Um, you know, really simple linking quality control checklist to each door frame, and then again, linking the status into our building information model. Great for color coding, and you can see very easily which doors are installed, and which ones have been QC'd, which ones haven't so far. Um, anyone who's lost a couple door frames on site can quickly appreciate the benefit of a supply chain management process for uh, doors, frames, and hardware. And we did a similar process on our MEP equipment as well. So we looked at uh, VABs, chilled beams, uh, key mechanical equipment like air handlers, pumps, um, and we put barcodes on those as well and linked that, that information back into our model. So we're able to track the status of that equipment through its installation, all the way through the commissioning process, which we're just getting into now on site. Um, of course, we did all our MEP coordination in 3D, uh, but we used that model to actually feed back into our supply chain model and into models that we used to verify installed work on site. So we're able to take the tablets out there, take the iPads out into the field, um, and navigate through the model as we're walking through the building and verify that the systems that are getting installed are matching what we coordinated in the model, which is something that we've struggled with on previous projects where you know, we've done our coordination in 3D, but something gets lost in translation when it gets out into the field. This was a great way for us to back check to make sure that what was being installed was actually matching what we were coordinating. And then the final piece of that tracking system on the MEP side is that we're able to integrate over into handover. So as we go through uh, this commissioning process, we're also linking in handover documentation. So product data, test reports, um, O&Ms, you know, maintenance instructions, all that information is getting linked in to each piece of equipment as we're going through the commissioning process and integrated over into our building information model so that we're able to turn over to NC State, our owner, an as-built model with all of this O&M information integrated in they can also export it and pull it into their facilities management system as well. Um, you know, it's got the COBE compliant fields in there. So there's, there's a great opportunity for integration into facilities management, which um, you know, is obviously very important. This is a, a lead silver building. Um, it really could have been lead gold. But uh, when you're getting into these high performing buildings, making sure that you've got a good transition into the operations and maintenance phase of its life cycle is really critical to make sure the building performs the way it should. So being able to give them rich electronic data about the systems they're getting all integrated into their BIM model will be very beneficial. Um, and what's nice uh, is that Bella has now also added their field BIM interactive pieces so that you've got access to this information right on the iPad. You can quickly switch between a piece of equipment in the list view that you see in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, quickly switch into a model view and see that equipment in 3D um, as you're looking at it out in the field, make sure all the connections are looking right, um, you know, have access to see what the connections are like above ceiling or, or behind a wall. Uh, really a great benefit to be able to switch back and forth between the equipment view here and the model in the field on the iPad, something that really hasn't been available in the past. So now to the fun part. Um, we were really excited about being able to implement all these new technologies on this project, but we didn't want to lose the opportunity to really step back and think about what was the benefit. You know, what were we really getting out of this? Because 
you can throw innovation at a problem for hours and hours, but you know, if it's really not making you more effective and more efficient, there's no point in doing it. So we really wanted to hone in on what were the systems, what were the solutions that were really adding value to the project, to our owner, to Skanska, um, throughout the life cycle of its delivery. And so we brought on our researcher from NC State, as I mentioned, um, and sort of outlined these, these steps here. So in his research, he looked at, you know, what are all the tools that are being implemented on the project? Uh, what, what were sort of the key features um, and, and the importance of those to the delivery model? He quantified benefits, he created an ROI, and then he actually gave us recommendations for future projects to say, you know, these are worth implementing again, these aren't, here are some ways you could change it to really optimize your ROI and, and drive as much efficiency as you can out of the process. So this research framework that you see was really the overarching structure. And so I'm going to talk through these in, in sort of the four pieces here. Um, the first step was the easiest. You know, determining the implementation cost is, is pretty much hard dollars uh, for the most part. So we quantified everything that was spent on hardware, software, um, training. We also looked at indirect costs. There were some things, you know, in the case of the electronic markups on documents, uh, all the red lines and linking of RFIs, we weren't ready to go to a fully paperless system. So we marked things up electronically, we marked them up in paper copies. So we counted some indirect costs and the additional time that people had to spend marking up drawings, loading them into Vela. We wanted to capture that as, as costs associated with this system. Um, then we looked at the benefits. And this was really one of the, the bigger challenges. So we'll talk about uh, exactly how we quantified it in a couple slides. But essentially, we looked at how were we doing things before and how were we doing things after implementing these new technology systems. And we wanted to use that information to look at efficiency gains. The next big challenge was how we translate those efficiency gains into actual dollars. And for us, it was about rework. Now, what's really important here, though, is that we learned that this benefits piece varies so much by the project and by the delivery model. So for us, we're in a CM at risk contract here in the state of North Carolina. Um, the CM at risk model essentially doesn't allow us to profit from increased efficiency on our general conditions. Um, you know, we're at risk with that guaranteed maximum price. So for us, there's relatively little opportunity for profit as a result of these innovations. It's really about driving down mistakes on the project and reducing rework, because that rework, um, some of it comes out of the subcontractor's pocket, but a lot of it comes out of contingency. And so if we can save on project contingency, we're saving money for our owner. And so we really need to look at this as what impact was it having on the money that was being spent out of contingency on rework on the project. So we'll, we'll talk about that. And then we need to look at the ROI in, in two pieces. As I mentioned, you know, only some of this is going to owner savings. The subcontractors have some savings as well because we're able to save them from making mistakes on the project. So we need to break down the ROI for the owner and for the project as a whole when you look at all the players involved. So as we get into actually quantifying the benefits, uh, I mentioned that we looked at our before and after. Um, in this case, we were looking specifically here at the use of Bella, the use of the field mobility solutions, the iPads, the tablets, electronically marking up documents, getting that out into the field. So we did a large survey with our entire project team and looked at how much time they spent on 20 or 25 different tasks on a given week on a typical project. And we looked at it before Bella was implemented on previous projects, and then again on this project when Bella was implemented. And we sort of neutralized for staffing levels to make sure that things were relatively equal. And we broke the tasks down into these four categories, for reactionary tasks, assessment tasks, planning tasks, and administrative items. The reason we did that is because we really needed to identify value-adding tasks. So what were the things that we were doing that were adding value to the project? And primarily, that came in planning and assessment, because those were the times and we were able to avoid mistakes and catch them before they became much more problematic. And that really fell into the reactionary, uh, reactionary category. So the two really biggest findings out of this study was that, for one, the overall time spent in a given week working went down, which was a great benefit for Skanska because it means our employees are happier. 
you know, they're spending less time getting stressed out. They're able to have a better work-life balance. But on a project like this, that doesn't drive savings for the owner because our general conditions are essentially lump sum. Um, you know, just because I work eight hours less doesn't mean there's eight hours times some hourly rate of savings that exists. You know, I'm paid uh, on salary, so that eight hour savings really cannot be quantified as far as dollars and cents go. Um, if you were talking about a different general condition structure and you could actually reduce staffing levels, then maybe you could quantify some of that as actual savings. But on a project like this, working less was not savings. It was just an overall benefit to Skanska and to the employees on the project. Now, we did find that there was an increase in the time that was spent planning, which is really interesting. So while we saved overall nine hours, uh, seven and a half of that went into going home early, but the other hour and a half went back into increasing the amount of time that was spent planning on the project. And so that was something that was really important in driving value. Um, and so we wanted to look at, you know, okay, now if we're spending an additional hour and a half planning, what benefit does that have to the project? So this challenge of quantifying benefits, I, I mentioned that we looked at it in the context of rework. And so our researcher went back and he looked at other scans for projects of similar size, scope, complexity, and he quantified roughly how much was spent on rework. He talked to subcontractors, found out you know, roughly how much they end up spending on rework, looked at change order logs, contingency logs, to get a baseline for rework expenditures. And then we needed to take the next step of looking at, you know, okay, if we can increase staffing, which increases planning and assessment, so those tasks that add value, if we can increase staffing, how does that impact rework? So we were also able to look then at two projects which were similar otherwise, but one had one additional person on it. So we were able to say, okay, with one more person on the project, here's a rough idea of how much rework we can avoid through the increased planning time on the project. So once we have that metric, we can now take that specifically to this project with our efficiency gains. So if we're saving an hour and a half a week, or more accurately, putting an extra hour and a half into our planning, how much rework can we avoid as a result of that? And then how do we distribute that to other parties? So in the case of the mobile technology here, um, what we did is we looked at, again, Bella, the use of the iPad, the tablets, uh, and we found that it helps us be, on average, about 8.5% more efficient. So that's based on that 1.5 hours a week of savings plus some additional travel time savings because we had documents on our iPad in the field um, we weren't having to go back and forth from the trailer to the job site to get plans. So that 8.5% gain in efficiency based on what we were saving uh, as a result of additional staffing for rework in that baseline equated to about $144,000 in avoided rework. And of that, about $105,000 was in project costs. Those were things that the owner was ending up paying for out of contingency. The rest of it were items that the subcontractor would end up paying for out of their pocket, mistakes that would be essentially their fault. Our researcher also went back and compared that to our actual change order and contingency logs to make sure that you know the baselines we had were valid, we were coming out with something that actually jived with our findings on the project. So he was able to sort of back check it and make sure that we were in a reasonable range there. So based on our actual hard cost the indirect costs for Vela, for the iPads, the tablets, um, the time we spent marking things up, that works out to an ROI of 23% for the owner on project costs and about 69% overall when you factor in the subcontractor savings, what they got out of it, um, and their missing costs. Now, what's interesting is for the subcontractors, you know, there's really no individual ROI because they're not spending any more. Um, you know, we're paying for Vela, we're paying for the iPads, we're doing the markups, but it becomes a benefit to them because it helps our superintendents solve problems for them and spot their mistakes much sooner so they're not spending a lot of money on rework. And our hypothesis is that in the long term, as our subcontractors become more efficient and their rework expenses go down, that's going to drive down bids and it's going to increase owner savings in the long run because subcontractors will realize, you know, I don't need to carry 10, 20% in my number for rework, 
if I'm really only spending 5%, you know, I can maybe carry 9% or, you know, 15% um, so I can be low, lower than my competition, uh, and still have some savings for myself, but it'll also drive some savings to the client as well. So we did a similar analysis here on the mobile electronic resource station, our kiosk out there that had the uh, TV and the computer with access to all this information, um, the plans, the specs, the model. What we found from talking to the subcontractors who were using the station, talking to our field guys, they were finding an overall reduction of about 42% in document control related rework. And we broke down our rework into items that were related to quality and items that were related to document control. So an example of document control related rework would be you know, someone not having the most up-to-date RFI or you know, simply missing a detail or a dimension on a plan sheet that they could have caught if they had access to that information. So by reducing about 42% of that, we were able to drive some pretty substantial savings. And again, this was talking to the subcontractors on what savings they were actually seeing. Overall, you know, it's pretty substantial, about $830,000. Um, and again, this is on a project of about $90 million, so uh, just to give you a sense of scale there, based on an initial purchasing cost of only about $5,000, this was a slam dunk on the ROI. It paid for itself uh, time and time again. We found actually a more interesting metric was the reduction in overall project cost, that you're able to actually save a fraction of a percent on your project cost um, just by getting this information out to the subcontractors in an easy, accessible way. Uh, you know, initially, they'd want to use it with us, with our superintendents. Um, but now, after having it for six or seven months, you know, they go up. There's a line out there. They're wanting to use it to check the plan, check the RFIs before they do their work. So it's really helped them take a lot more pride in their work and making sure that what they're installing is what they're supposed to be installing. Because, you know, really, they don't want to be building it twice. Uh, you know, for the most part, they care about their quality that they're putting in. So this is a great way for us to really add some value to them and to the project overall. And when we looked at recommendations for future projects, we found that the ROI was uh, pretty positive for any job valued over roughly five to seven million dollars. So you know, on, on little small projects, uh, that five thousand dollar purchasing cost was a little bit too much to justify the expense. But you know, for us, the vast majority of our projects are over you know, 20 million or so. So for Skanska, it's really a, a worthwhile investment. And we're starting to see them pop up on our projects, uh, not only around the Carolinas, but around the country as well. We also did a quick ROI study on our use of BIM. Um, and we talked about looking at all the aspects of BIM, whether that's quantification of uh, materials for the estimate, or the 4D scheduling, the visualization. But we really ended up just focusing on the clash detection and coordination because that was where we were able to draw the most hard costs. A lot of the other items, we were starting to get into a little kind of wishy-washy quantification. And we really wanted to focus in only on what we could quantify more tangibly, um, especially because this was an academic research paper. We wanted to uh, you know, be as legit as possible here. So we looked at our coordination for MEP systems in 3D. What was nice was that our previous project here at NC State, uh, which was you know six or seven years ago, was done, coordinated in 2D um, with a lot of the same team members, the same mechanical, electrical, plumbing subcontractors, and actually a, a pretty similar size and scope. So we were able to get a, a very realistic baseline on savings, not only as far as dollars saved, but also time spent. So we were able to get about a 33% reduction in coordination time, which was, again, beneficial because we were on the critical path. But we were also able to quantify the avoided rework. And we looked at that by not only listing and quantifying the issues that we caught in the model that we wouldn't have caught in 2D, but again, also going back and looking at how much we actually spent on coordination, MEP coordination related issues at the end of the project on our, uh, you know, CN uh, log and on our contingency expenses. So, you know, looking at it both ways from list of the clashes, but also on the back side from the cost standpoint, and we came up with about ninety thousand dollars in savings there, which was very conservative. Uh, we felt like we probably could have found a lot more, but again, we wanted to stay as conservative and tangible as possible since this was an academic study. 
Um, and again, that was split between subcontractor savings, things that they would have been responsible for fixing in the field, and things that were really uh, coordination things that would have come out of contingency. And again, ROI here was a slam dunk, 82% um, to the owner and over 200% overall to the project when you factored in those subcontractor savings. So at the end here, we looked at our overall uh, ROI for all of our pieces of the implementation for the mobile technology, Bella, the iPads, the mobile electronic resource station, the use of BIM, um, and we put it all together, and our savings to the owner was quantified at about 100%, and overall to the project, 800%. Again, a lot of that was driven by the savings on the mobile plan station. Um, but we were really happy to see these kind of results and savings. We weren't sure you know, exactly where the value was going to come out. But I think the biggest lesson that we learned from this was the savings that came from the mobile electronic resource station. It was such an easily implemented piece of technology um, and something that now we can standardize for Skanska projects and really easily roll out across the country. Um, that, that was really a great lesson learned for us. And, you know, since we've done this, we've uh, also taken on a, an enterprise agreement with Vela. Um, so that's getting rolled out more broadly across the company as well. Um, and we're also an enterprise uh, partner with Autodesk. So, um, you know, all these items are getting really implemented more broadly, but it's great to see the mobile electronic resource station really picking up as well as something that our projects can use nationwide. And so with that, I'm going to turn things over to Josh to give a uh, quick rundown of Bell Systems, and then we will open it up for any Q&A. Sounds great, Will. Thanks a lot. So I just have a few slides here to introduce Vela as a company and then talk about how the folks can get more information around the software that you used on this project and also watch other YouTube videos and other webinars as well to get uh, more good content. So one quick slide on who Vela Systems is. We're a software company and our mission statement is to revolutionize the construction industry by changing the way work in the field is done and managed. So it's an ambitious mission statement. We use the words revolutionize because there's a lot going on right now in both the technologies that can help construction and then how they're being applied. So if you just think about three trends in technology that are out there in the industry right now, there's iPads, as you were talking about, Will. There's cloud computing, which you didn't mention by name, but it's what's in the background helping to coordinate and drive all the collaboration that you were talking about through Vela. And then last but not least, BIM. Those three trends, iPads, cloud computing, and BIM, are really powerful technology trends. What Vela Systems is doing as a software platform for field management, we're taking those three technology trends and putting them in an easy to use, very powerful framework for doing things differently out at the point of construction, doing things out in the field in a different way. You see that in our mission statement, beyond the word revolutionize, it's by changing the way work in the field is done and managed. Doing it, whether it's uh, the coordination and field verification, back checking as you called it, Will, uh, on MEP systems by looking at the model on the iPad and looking back at what was done. Um, and manage, so that's doing. Managing is how you take the information and make it flow as efficiently as possible. You gave a great example, Will, around how through using Vela, the information can flow directly from one project participant to another. Maybe it's from a trade directly to the AE, but you have visibility into it, but you're not stuck in the middle reformatting spreadsheets and getting in the way of the communication. So you get visibility uh, and control but you don't get the over the uh, headache and the timing. So the next slide is all about what specifically we do. So Will gave a bunch of great examples through his presentation. There's quality programs, safety programs, bringing documents to the field, and then the whole management of equipment, whether it's uh, the unitized curtain wall system that Will was talking about or the VAV boxes as one example of commissioned equipment coming in to the Hunt Library or you know even some of the robotics for that really cool uh, you know, three-story deep, human-free um, book stack, um, which are which are amazing to see in person. So those are the things. Those are what we do. If you go to the next one, there, Will, it's around how we do it. So when we talk about programs, we're not just talking about Hunt Library. We're talking about how you can manage quality, safety, and other field programs like commissioning across your company. We're really, really happy 
uh, that Skanska has chosen Vela in, in, in an enterprise deployment. Um, because what you can do is you can leverage some of these technologies, the online and mobile document library with markup, uh, the checklists with company-wide templates. You can leverage those across your firm um, to, in the example of checklists, build you know, either CSI or master format based uh, checklist libraries that you can share across jobs. So if there are other folks that are um, let's say doing uh, need to do VAV, uh, let's say you know um, installation or equipment receipt type checklists, you can have those in a library that you can borrow from and then tailor for the needs of your job. Or let's say precast you know inspection checklists. Issues and tasks are how you track the specific uh, observations that are happening in the field, and then that's the flow of data that Will was talking about. And the analytical reporting for management is what Will started uh, at the beginning with actually that dashboard that had bar charts, root causes, and a whole bunch of other information that you can use because you now have it. And that's a really big difference is that you've got information that's actually flowing from the job site. The last piece that we'll highlight here is fill, uh, what we call field BIM. Uh, eight years, uh, not eight years ago, um, it was back in 2008, I meant to say, we worked on the Meadowlands job with Skanska and tied building information models to precast concrete. That was the example Will showed during his presentation, we called that field BIM data, which is tying model objects like from Navisworks uh, to specific construction activities in the field, materials tracking, materials, uh, not just supply chain tracking, but also the management of the quality around those materials. What we've done now in the last six months is come out with something we call field BIM interactive, which Will mentioned is new. Uh, we, we have a little symbol for that on the right. It's those little cubes on the iPad. What that lets you do is actually see the objects in the field in 3D, but not just view them. You actually can tie them back to all of the workflow elements, whether it's checklists or issues or even threaded comment trails that then connect that information, connect what you're doing in the field, whether it's back checking as installed versus as coordinated, or even uh, figuring out what you need to do in a particular area of the job for a particular day. So that was our mission statement. That's who we are. Um, Great thing about these webinars, and uh, this is a good a good way for me to to uh, introduce a, a thank you to Will and to Ray and to Fiatech overall. Um, the great thing about these webinars is you're not listening to me talk about uh, Vela or the vendor; you're actually hearing it straight from Will. And you know, I can say that um, their Will's research and uh, research of uh, you know the NC of NC State on this project was really cutting edge in that it wasn't just looking at the project-based benefits around what were the, what was the value of these technologies. But it was really applying a rigorous academic framework to it, which was great. And the, whether it's Vela on iPads or Vela used in those you know, mobile resource stations, it's all about bringing the technology out to the point of construction. So if you want to see what Will looks like, if you want to actually see him using these technologies in the field, you can go to velasystems.com and in the bottom right, you can you see a YouTube video. That's actually Will there. That's not a stunt double. That's actually him. And uh, you'll he has a YouTube video that walks you through um, some of what he showed you in this webinar. Uh, but he shows you live. Shows you live on the iPad. Shows you some of those screenshots and as this works as well. Just turn down your computer speakers. It has some loud music in it to get started uh, for the project. You can also, if you want to try this stuff out yourself, go to velosystems.com. You can view a demonstration. You can sign up for a free trial of the whole software suite. The same stuff that Will was using on Hunt Library, you can use yourself for free for 30 days and check out how it goes. Of course, you can always call us at 888-VELOSYS or shoot us an email at info at velosystems.com if you want more information as well. So with that, I'll say thanks again to Will for all the work on this project, and thanks to Fiatech for the SETI Award, recognizing what Will and his team did and, and uh, how we at Vela helped support them. You know, our customers' success and them talking about it is the greatest validation that we can have of what we're trying to do, which is change the way work is done and managed on construction. So thanks for that, and I'll turn it back to Will and Ray. Thanks, Josh and Will. Really great presentation. and. Uh, really fantastic information on the return of, on investment and benefits in the industry. There's a huge challenge out there to document what is the benefit coming back from technology implementation and applications and your rigorous process here of 
defining benefits in ROI, a really great contribution uh, for showing how there is benefit in these implementations. So thanks very much for your presentation. We did get only one question that I see through the session that came earlier on, but I, I you were on a good flow, Will, so I didn't stop. It was, the uh, question was, why did you change from the Motion F5 uh, pads to the iPads for your field application? The, uh, the biggest reason for that was the fact that uh, we were seeing a huge shift in the industry towards applications running on the iPad. Um, and they were obviously a much less expensive solution. You could buy, you know, five iPads for the cost of one of these uh, motion tablets. Um, and that's even with, you know, a, a Bluetooth barcode scanner um, as well. And so when Bella came out with their uh, iPad-based application, now that, you know, Navisworks um, is not too far off on the iPad, uh, that really became clearly a uh, more cost-effective solution for us uh, from a field mobility standpoint. Okay, great. Uh, so, well, a question I'll ask is, uh, what feedback did you receive from the owner dur during the project? So, uh, clearly good interaction with the subcontractor in accessing information and benefits described from them. and. Uh, how did the how did the owner observe the implementation of this technology, and what feedback did you receive from them? Yeah, so this was something that you know we shared with the owner at our weekly meetings. Um, you know, when we were going through the curtain wall installation, we would regularly pull up the model with all the color coding done to show the status of the the curtain wall progress and where we were with the supply chain. Um, you know, whenever they walked the job, they would see the mobile plan station. So. It really became, I think, very uh, intrinsic and, and native to the way that we were building and our culture out here on the project. Um, when it came to the initial implementations, uh, you know, we, we've had a, a long relationship with NC State. Uh, we've built a number of projects for them out here, especially on Centennial Campus. You know, we, we've been building here for the better part of a decade now, um, one project after another. And so, when it came to us coming to them and saying, you know, hey, we want to implement iPads, we want to do this stuff with Vela, um, we want to really take the use of BIM to the next level. They were very, very open to, to what we wanted to do because we built up that trust. You know, they, they've worked with us, they know that you know, we're going to use these technologies to drive value. Um, and I, I think just the fact that they viewed us as their trusted advisor, um, they knew that you know, we weren't going to go out spending money frivolously on these things. Um, we would focus in, in on what was going to drive value to them and to the project as a whole. So they've been very happy with um, with our use of technology. It, it showed off this project to uh, a lot of folks within not only NC State but other university systems uh, in the area as well. Now, this is maybe a two-part question, but uh, where are you in the status of the project right now? That really leads into my question, is the owner uh, engaging to look at any benefits from this information in the handover and commissioning process for the building. Yeah, so we're just wrapping up interiors now um, and starting to get into commissioning, and so we're, we're just getting into those workflows and processes. We've sat down with the uh, facilities folks at NC State and sort of outlined, you know, what the expectations are for our as-built model and our BIM deliverable as far as O&M integration and all those parts and pieces, what's going to be included in the model. Um, and of course, we'll be sort of integrating all that through Vela. Uh, but this is really their first time getting this kind of rich electronic data, especially in model form. Um, and so, you know, a lot of this is sort of us at Skanska and then the handful of folks at NC State who are really trying to champion this sort of guessing on what they may find useful down the road. Um, as with, you know, a, a lot of folks, uh, they're not necessarily fully competent on how they can use BIM on the facility side, um, but, you know, we're trying to equip them for the future with essentially a, a, a toolkit that, that they'll be able to use if in a couple of years they decide, hey, 
you know, we really want to integrate the building information model in the way we're managing the system from an FM side. Uh, they can do that. Right now, we're sort of focusing on some of the most basic data integration um, over into their existing FM database. Uh, but they haven't started looking at benefits of that yet. I think that'll be something that happens, you know, over the next year or so. Okay. Great. Well, we're still a few minutes early, but I don't see any more questions. I think a fantastic job of of uh, s presenting the highlights, Will, and and uh, demonstrating the savings through the construction phase, and really impressive to see how the subcontractors engaged with your with your mobile information station. So, again, really appreciate both you and Josh sharing that with us today, and we'll wrap up here. Uh, early with uh, no more questions from the audience. So, thanks everyone and uh, we'll have another, another webinar coming up next week. Bye now. Thank you, Greg.